It, well, I think that what you've just said really boils down to saying that the investigation of our use of language and our use of concepts is an investigation of the structure of the world, yes. of the world yes. as experienced by human yes. beings. Yes. There's an obvious relationship between what you just said there and Wittgenstein's and the logical positivist's doctrine that, la that philosophy, the proper task of philosophy, consists not in uh, formulating doctrines, mm -hmm. but in the activity of analysis, yes, that yes, philosophy ought right. to be analysis yes. and uh, the organon of science. Yes, yes. Now, this, it seems to me, had enormous influence on the educated layman. I went up to Oxford as an undergraduate uh, during the years after the war, and people who were not studying philosophy mm. at all seemed to me to have come very much under the influence of some of these doctrines. Uh, in particular, one was if, if one tried to make an assertion of any kind about any subject, nothing to do with philosophy, yes, yes. one was immediately pinned against the yes. wall by people who said to you, how would you go about verifying that yes, statement? Yes. Or what exactly do you yes. mean by that? What kind of an answer do you want to that question? Are you you're conscious of, uh, of that having I, been said? I think I was, uh, I think I was partly responsible for that, <laughs> yes. Now, coming to your responsibility for this, mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting at this stage to come to your connection with the movement. Mm -hmm. You've described who the main people in Vienna yes. were, You've talked about what some yes. of their central doctrines were. Now, you are well known as the figure oh. who introduced these doctrines into England, yes. where they have, I must say, had an enormous influence ever since, right up to and including this day. Yes. How did you come to do that? Well, I was uh, up at Oxford in late 20... I, went, I came up in 29, took my schools in 1930, 1932, and I was at... Christchurch, a pupil of Gilbert Riles, and when I took my schools, I was appointed a lecturer at, at Christchurch and given a few months' leave of absence. And uh, I thought I'd go to Cambridge to study under Wittgenstein, but uh, Gilbert Riles said, no, don't do that. Uh, go to Vienna instead. He happened to meet Schlick at a congress, I think in, it was in Oxford also, two years before, and he had half an hour's conversation with him and, and thought that he was interesting and got the impression something was going on in Vienna. I think he'd also perhaps read some of the articles they produced. So he said to me, well, not go to Vienna, find out what's happening there. We know roughly what Wittgenstein is doing at Cambridge. We don't know what's happening in Vienna. You come back and uh, go there and find out and tell us. Well, I didn't speak very much German. I spoke hardly any German at that time, but I thought well, I probably could learn enough just to follow what was going on. And so I went um, with a letter of introduction to Schlick from Gilbert. And, and Schlick, I now see, in reached I see this astonishing at the time, seemed to be quite natural, but said, come and join the circle. Uh, and so I did. <laughs> and yeah. uh, the only other foreigner allowed in was uh, Quine, the fa American, American philosopher, the famous American philosopher. We were there together. And this was in what? I went, went to Vienna in November 32 and stayed until the spring of 33. And you, you were in your very early 20s? I was in my, yes, I was, I was, I was, uh, but let me think. In, yes, I was uh, no. I was younger than that. I must have been just uh, twenty-three. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, twenty-two. I was twenty-two. Oh, twenty-two. Mm -hmm. Just twenty-two. Mm -hmm. And, and you, I, um, I sat then, and I, I didn't contribute. My German wasn't good enough, and it was mainly debates between Schlick and Neurath at that time. On and on and on and on the discussion went, and I sat and listened, and then came back to England, very full of all this. I wrote a paper in mine called "Demonstration of the Impossibility of Metaphysics," which was simply borrowed from the verification principle. And then Isaiah Berlin uh, said to me, I was, we used to meet regularly and talk for us together, he said, you're, you're so full of this, why don't you write a book about it? And I said, why not? And so I sat down and in 18 months wrote Language, Truth and Logic. And it, I wrote it when I was 24, and it was published when I was just 25. Were you astounded by the explosive consequences? Well, it that? didn't have all that uh, uh, um, great success at the beginning. It had a success at Scandal. The older philosophers at Oxford were absolutely outraged by it, and in fact, it was very hard for me to get a teaching job at Oxford. I didn't get one before the war. I was always a research fellow. Mm. It was only after the war when it got reprinted that there's this, that was this, it had this enormous success. And got, I suppose already uh, before the war, when it first came out, it did impress the younger people. They were very excited by it. Because they did see this as a liberation. You see, Oxford philosophy before the war was terribly sterile. There were some old men who were only interested in the history of philosophy, only interested in repeating what Plato had said and, and, and trying to put down anyone and say anything new. And that was logic with this, did seal with this huge mind put under these people, did seem to the younger people as a liberation. They did, seem, they did feel they could breathe. And I think that way it had a big historical effect. And I'd like to hear you say something about the influence you think it had outside philosophy. It seems to me to have had obvious effects, not only in science and logic and philosophy, but in things like literary criticism or yes. in history and so on. It probably had less effect than, than on in, within science than, for example, the work of Karl Popper. The, his, his, uh, his Logic of Scientific Discovery, which came out in the German edition in, in about the same time, about a year or so earlier, I think probably appealed more to the scientists themselves. 
But even so, even with language and logic, the scientists felt that this was all right. I mean, they were told they were, after all, the most important people. But they didn't have to. <laughs> they liked that. They didn't yeah. have to worry about the philosophers standing over and said, "Oh, we mustn't say that." Not that they ever had yeah. worried much. But, but yeah. it was nice to be told that, 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 they, that what they were doing was really the, the fundamental thing. But if one takes, if one takes not only your book, yes. uh, but but the whole movement of which mm, your book yes. was about logical positivism, yes. what do you think the influence of that was? Well, on I think other it, I think there was a great emphasis on on clarity and a great opposition to what might be called wooliness. Um, there was a kind of, of uh, injunction to look at the facts, to see things as they are, be a bit of humbug. All this is very attractive to young people in any field, and it felt that, that and it went with, I think, a um, a general reaction against Victorian hypocrisy, really. And this was is, seen as stripping off the, 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 I mean, it was the, it was the, the, uh, the Hans Andersen child, which, as you said in your opening remarks, was functioning everywhere, saying the emperor has no clothes. There he is parading around with his huge robes and so on, and, and patients bowed out. And the, the fellow's naked. And this notion, the fellow's naked, which that, with the logical points were taken to be saying, was very exciting for anyone doing any subject. And of course, that, that is enough in itself to explain the huge and passionate hostilities that oh, were aroused against indeed, logical yes, populism. Yes, indeed. Authoritarian governments like the communist yes, and Nazi yes. governments banded all together, oh, yes, didn't yes, they? And yes, uh, yes. even uh, liberals were, were discomforted by Dis it. A little, yes, yes. Yes, yes. They thought it was too iconoclastic. Yes, yes. But now, it must have had actually some real defects. What do you now, in retrospect, think that the main shortcomings of the movement were? Well, I suppose the, most of the defects is that nearly all of it was false. <laughs> I think you need to say uh, a little more about that. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose that's, that's being too harsh on it. I, I think that I, I still want to say that it was true in spirit, in a way, that the attitude was right. Yeah. But if one goes for the details, first of all, the verification principle never got itself properly formulated. I, I tried uh, several times, uh, and always it always let in either too, uh, too little or, or, or too much. And to this day, it hasn't received a, a properly, logically precise uh, formulation. Then the reductionism just doesn't work. I mean, you, 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 you can't reduce statements. Even state, you can't reduce even state, ordinary, simple statements about cigarette cases and glasses and ashtrays to statements about sense data, uh, let alone the more abstract statements of science. So the really exciting, strict reductionism of, of Schlick and the early Russell and so on uh, doesn't work. And the annual thing on the wishy-washy, which almost nobody would, would uh, dissent from, that uh, a scientific hypothesis must be have some relation to observation. Uh, I mean, this is all that, 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 that remains there. It seems to me uh, at least very doubtful whether statements of logic and mathematics are, are analytic in any interesting sense. But the whole analytic synthetic distinction has been put in question by the work of recent philosophers like, like Quine. It's no longer I think so. I still want to maintain it in some form. It's never so clear cut as I once thought it was. And um, I'm not sure. In some sense, obviously, statements about mathematics are different from, from uh, uh, statements about uh, the empirical world. But saying, as I, as I said, they're true by convention, I'm not at all sure all this is right. Anyhow, it needs a lot of defending. Again, um, the whole, I mean, certainly, in language and logic, the reduction of statements about the past to statements about uh, their future ev evidence for them is wrong. My treatment of other minds was wrong. My treatment of ethics, I think, was still on the right lines, though, though, though much too uh, uh, summary. So if you, if you go in detail, very, very little survives. What survives is the sort of general rightness of the approach, I think. The, the, um... Would you agree with, the, with me if I tried to put it this way, that, that looking back on it, what seems to have been enormously uh, good about the achievement of logical positivism is almost entirely negative. That is to say, it did clear away mm -hmm. whole areas right. of yes. hitherto plausible yes. philosophizing, yes. which were now seen under the, uh, yes. through, through the lenses of That's the new right. logic and the new science, yes. not to be acceptable. Mm -hmm. So that whole traditional areas got, so to speak, cleared of lumber. Yes. Uh, but it now looks as if all they actually succeeded in doing was clear the ground, because what they tried to build on that ground that they cleared isn't standing up. Well, it's a little more than this. It was very liberating. I think if we, perhaps we can go back to something said not by a logical positivist, but by a pragmatist, William James. And, of course, pragmatism, which came earlier, is in many ways very akin to logical positivism. William James had a phrase in which he, in which he asked for the cash value of statements. Now, I think this is very important on the positive side. The early positives went wrong in thinking that we still maintained a gold standard. That, that, that if you took if you said your notes, you could get gold for them, which of course you can't. There isn't enough gold, and then too many notes. 
But nevertheless, there must be some backing to the currency. And this, this is, I think, what, what comes out. But if, if someone makes an assertion, all right, perhaps you can't translate it uh, into observational terms, but still, it's important to ask, for clarifying it, how you would set about testing it, what observations were. But this, I think, still holds good so former, and is positive. Former logical positivists like yourself, yes. uh, although you, you, you now say that most of the do detailed doctrine yes, yes, falls, yes, yes. are still immensely influenced by that whole approach oh, yes. and, and are addressing yourself to much the same questions, yes, but in yes. a more liberal open sort of way. I would say this is so, yes. Yeah. yes. Now, uh, I'm a much older man, I do it much sl more, more slowly, possibly, I'm more certainly with less brilliance than there was no brilliance before, perhaps more soundly. I hope perhaps I've learned something with the years. Thank you very much, Professor Ayer.